Welcome to the Hope and Healing Center. I'm so glad all of you could be here this evening. If you're not familiar with our organization, please visit our website, www.hopeandhealingcenter.org, and sign up for our newsletter, and you'll learn a little bit more about us. I'm happy tonight that we can host the Building Bridges event, and I'm going to introduce Mark, or say hi to Mark, and he's going to come introduce the panelists. Hello, my name is Mark Yearwiz. I'm uh, an intern at Baylor uh, College of Medicine. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm here to just introduce kind of the event. Uh, so first of all, this, is, this event is hosted by PROPS, which stands for, I'm going to say it, um, Psychiatry Resident Outreach uh, to the Public Sector. This was an organization that uh, Baylor College of Medicine uh, Psychiatry Residents founded back in 1982. One of our second year residents at that time, uh, Dr. John Battaglia, uh, created a, uh, a program with HISC with, um, with the, um, the Houston uh, Psychiatric Society and, um, and with the Baylor College of Medicine program, an outreach uh, suicide awareness education program for, uh, for mil uh, elementary students at that time. Uh, the, the props organization has been uh, very active since then, and one of the things that we created out of that was the Building Bridges, um, specifically to build a bridge between the mental health and uh, the spiritual religious community in Houston. Our, the, the overall props uh, goals are to address the misconception of, of mental health treatments, to decrease the stigma associated with seeking help f and, and caring for emotional illnesses, and to enhance the interface between spirituality, religion, and mental health. So the Building Bridges is very much in line with that. Um, <clears throat> the event today um, is regarding suicide. Suicide is, uh, I, th I think that we can all agree from any spiritual, any humanistic uh, uh, perspective that uh, the human life is very precious. And it's profoundly impacting uh, to the community, to the family, to many people when there is a suicide. Uh, it is a, it, there's, there's a missed opportunity for healing and then there's a lot of healing that needs to follow um, for the people who are left behind from suicide. Uh, from the from the kind of the, if I'm going to put on the hat of, of the kind of dry statistician from a clinician, we, we can look at data saying that generally that uh, r religious experience, religious affiliation is protective in some ways. It's a very complex, you know, a very complex phenomena, we could say, uh, to be involved with religion. It's a very meaningful endeavor. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a personal endeavor. It's a spiritual experience. It's a community endeavor. Um, it also has a moral ethical guideline. There's many aspects, and so it's very, it's very complex to see uh, how how religion and and uh, suicide interact. Are we talking about? Uh, are we talking about when people start to think about suicide if they try to attempt? Uh, so there, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot to talk about. So I think it's wonderful that we're here. Uh, one of one of the the tricks or one of the wonderful things we take advantage of in, in healing in the psychotherapeutic perspective is, uh, is conversation, conversation to heal. It involves a little bit of patience, a little compassion and courage to explore and have to explore what's painful and what's positive within us. So I think it's wonderful that we're all here and I hope that we can have those qualities in, in the dialogue that, that we have here tonight. Um, <clears throat> so to start, I'd like to introduce uh, the first of our panelists, Dr. James Lomax. He is someone that's very dear to us in the program. Uh, to say officially, doc Dr. Lomax is a professor of psychiatry at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, he is a native uh, to Houston. He's he's been uh, we've been very privileged to have him uh, to have him uh, work and train and and uh, serve Houston. He is a graduate of Rice University uh, and has also completed all the way up through psychoanalysis training here in Houston as well. Uh, very happy to have him. One of his big focuses, <clears throat> one of the unique gifts that he's given us is, is looking at the interface between, uh, between religion, spirituality, and mental health. Trying to, uh, to, to, look, at, uh, to look at loss, grief, and healing uh, in the different methods that we can encourage that, uh, specifically from the psychoanalytic perspective and enhanced dialogue. And he's been very involved with the Institute for Spirituality and Health, the uh, Center for, for Hope and Healing, also with uh, the Rice Humanities Department, the Religious Studies Department. Um, so I'm very happy to get to introduce this uh, wonderful mentor of ours. So I'll turn it over. Okay, so next up, um, I am very excited to introduce um, the next panelist, um, Sheikh Joe Bradford. 
Um, he is a author and entrepreneur and an American scholar of Islamic studies. Um, he holds a graduate degree in Islamic law from Medina University. Um, he's very active and involved in the Houston uh, Muslim community. He's a wonderful, engaging speaker, and he blogs from um, joebradford.net. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christina Smith. I'm a fourth year resident in the psychiatry department, and I am pleased to introduce Dr. Beverly Dew. Um, she is a psychiatrist and assistant professor within our department. She graduated from Harvard Medical School and completed her residency training at Columbia University. Dr. Dew um, actually serves as the medical director of the intensive outpatient program at Bentop General Hospital, and she also is very actively engaged um, and serves as the um, administrator for the residency psychotherapy education within our department as well. She has a strong interest in cultural psychiatry and is involved in a lot of our um, lecture, lectures and didactics, so we are really pleased to have her here to speak on this topic today. Hi, good evening. My name is Lauren Pace. I'm a fourth year psychiatry resident as well, um, and I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Tom Ellis. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Ellis last year in a supervisory role. I was his supervisee, he was my supervisor, um, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, more formally, Dr. Ellis earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Texas at Austin, and then his doctorate from Baylor University. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Psychological Association, uh, and also a diplomat of the American Board of Professional Psychology in the Cognitive, Be Cognitive Behavior Therapy Division. He's a founding fellow of the American Academy of Cognitive Therapy and associate fellow of the Albert Ellis Institute. His research and publications focus primarily on the problem of suicide, including cognitive characteristics of suicidal individuals and effecti effectiveness of suicide-specific therapeutic interventions. He has written several books, among which are Suicide Risk, Assessment and Response Guidelines, Choosing How to Live, How to Defeat Suicide Through Cognitive Therapy, and also <coughs> Cognition and Suicide, Theory, Research, and Practice. He is the 2011 recipient of the Roger J. Tierney Award from the American Association of Suicidology in recognition of distinguished, con distinguished contributions to the organization and the field of suicidology. So welcome, Dr. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Scott. I'm one of the first year residents at Baylor College of Medicine. I'm really excited to be here tonight. I'm also really excited to introduce Reverend Gregory Hahn. Um, he happens to be the director of the Interfaith, Relation, of Interfaith Relations at Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston. Um, and since 2014, he's actually led a four person staff in building the network, strengthening relationships, and providing resources um, across religious traditions in the Houston area. So it was pretty natural that we would ask him to be here. Um, also, uh, for six years, he was actually on the faculty at St. John's School, uh, where he taught courses in religion and ethics, um, and also uh, coordinated the chapel program. Um, he has degrees from Georgetown University and Harvard Divinity School. And uh, on a little bit more uh, personal note to the program, he's actually married to one of our former chief residents, um, who's still very involved with our program. So thank you very much for being here tonight. Hi, uh, I'm Michelle Villa Castillo. I'm one of the uh, first year residents at uh, Baylor College of Medicine for Psychiatry. And I'm introducing uh, Father Lawrence uh, Jaswayak. Um, I don't know Father Lawrence personally, uh, but our connection comes from a friend of mine who I went to Catholic school with, and she was getting married last year. And uh, during her marriage preparation, that's how she met uh, Father Lawrence. Um, so I was very uh, thankful to her to um, put us into contact. So I feel very blessed to have him here tonight with us. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, Father uh, Lawrence Joswayak is a, a native Houstonian, actually. He received uh, a Catholic education first grade uh, through uh, St. Pius uh, High School. Um, and he went to the University of Houston, actually, um, for the uh, first two years and graduated from Texas A&M University in 1980 with a uh, bachelor's in accounting. 
um, he received a CPA license and worked for an oil and gas company. He entered St. Mary Seminary and was ordained a priest on May 23rd of 1987, receiving a master's degree in divinity from the University of St. Thomas in Houston. He received a graduate degree in canon law uh, from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. in 1991. He is the pastor and rector of the Co-Cathedral of the Sacred Heart since 2008, the judicial vicar for the Metropolitan Tribunal for the, Ar I can't even pronounce this word, uh, <laughs> Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston since 1997, and an adjunct professor of canon law at the Graduate School of Theology for the University of St. Thomas, located at St. Mary Seminar since 2001. So thank you so much, Father Lawrence, for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> All right, so we'd like to get started today. Um, just a note quickly. Um, we have distributed note cards for people in the audience as well as some pens. If you have questions that come up during the program, um, we thought it might be better to write the those cards um, so that questions can remain anonymous that way. Can everyone hear us okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I'd like to start the program a little bit more um, in an open-ended fashion. Um, I'd like to ask each panelist if they could talk briefly about a personal experience that they've had working with a patient or who is struggling with mental illness or uh, suicidal thoughts or who has ultimately completed suicide. Dr. Lomas, if you'd like to start. Well, this is pretty short. I think we're supposed to keep this to around uh, five minutes each. Is mm -hmm. that right? So I'll uh, tell two stories about how I got interested in this topic. They, they both involve uh, patients of mine who did complete suicide. These are devastating uh, events in my life as well as the life of the patient, the family, and people who loved and cared about them. Uh, the first patient was a young woman with two small children who was sent to me after she was discharged from Methodist Hospital for recurrent major depression. Trauma is often a factor in recurrent uh, resist, treatment-resistant depression, and she had a history of trauma, which we were talking about seeming to do quite well her symptoms uh, and swap out. okay is that any better is this one working oh you got I, Sorry. you just have to eat the microphone <laughs> okay <laughs> So I'm going to get back to the story the patient was doing uh, better we had stopped the medications uh, but the revisiting of the trauma of her childhood in our work together turned out to be very difficult and complex and she uh, took her life shortly after a meeting with me in which she was struggling with this particular uh, issue her uh, she had called my office after taking an overdose uh, she uh, and I talked on the phone this was before 911 so I was struggling with how to get her help we were doing that. She attempted to uh, get to vomit up the medicine that she had taken. Uh, she uh, aspirated the vomitus, and by the time she got to the hospital, was this uh, brain dead. Uh, one of the worst times in my life was hearing this, uh, going to the hospital to meet her family, uh, her mother, and her uh, husband especially, and. Our time there together was a sort of mutual consolation and for both of us uh, experiencing guilt, what we could have done, shame about us being unsuccessful and helping her, et cetera, et cetera. Her mother herself had committed or attempted to commit suicide by shooting herself through the roof of the mouth and uh, when the, my patient was experiencing this trauma during her childhood and so she felt she had been a role model, and I felt I had not been an adequate help. Um, our conversations 
went on for uh, about a year, and as often happens, there was a particularly powerful uh, meeting at the anniversary of her uh, daughter's uh, death uh, a year later. Um, that got me interested in this from a whole bunch of reasons, including learning more about what I could do to be more helpful for someone experiencing and re-experiencing trauma, and also for the care of the uh, providers who are touched by suicide, including congregants. Uh, later experience for me was uh, one of my uh, oldest daughter, Laura, who some of you know is one of her best friends and uh, her uh, Sunday school group at St. Philip Presbyterian, where Greg was a minister, her father committed suicide when, uh, in the middle of the, uh, his, uh, her daughter's senior year in high school. So working with the congregants at that time was another thing that uh, increased and expanded my interest in that. Subsequently, I'm fairly often a consultant after a suicide to help the practitioner, sometimes the family members, to uh, cope with suicide. So the big picture things is this is a huge issue. Faith communities can be extremely important and helpful, uh, but it has to do with having very difficult conversations that we're rarely actually very well prepared to, to have. I'll start just in, in general. Um, my experiences, whether it's been as a pastor or as a high school teacher, or in particular, I was a freshman proctor uh, at Harvard for two years, so I had somewhere around 18 or 19 freshmen under my guide, guidance. Um, we're often, and especially in the pastoral context, we're often on, on the front lines, that first responder, and need to quickly recognize when and uh, in, in what ways we can be helpful pastorally and theologically, and then, and when we, and then realize when we quickly, uh, or not so quickly, but when we reach that limit of our ability to, um, to, to provide care, and then that's when um, established relationships with mental health providers is really important so that when you run into that time when you need to get extra help for this person, you're not fumbling around looking for a phone number or looking for good care. You've had those, uh, those relationships established beforehand so that the care that can happen is both pastoral, theological, but also um, re re relies upon the professional mental health community. Specifically, um, I was a solo pastor after I left St. Saint Philip. I was a solo pastor from 2005 to 2008 at a church, a Presbyterian church in the suburbs. And my very first funeral and my very last funeral in those three years were suicides. My very first funeral is the one that, I, that I'll, I'll talk about um, briefly. I had been at this church for two weeks. And so I was still getting to know the congregation. And I got a call. I, was, I got a call from uh, my church administrator saying something had happened. And of course, she was disoriented. And I was naturally disoriented because I didn't know the congregation well. So uh, fortunately, I had done a year of clinical pastoral education. And it was uh, those skills that I really relied upon, which was, Whenever you go into a room in a hospital, you have no idea what's going on, and you can't go up and say, "Hi, I'm, you know, I'm the chaplain resident. What's going on here?" You need to figure things out as you as things are going as things are going along. So I had had those skills built. So I went over to the house, and there had been a death, and but again, uh, suicide is so disorienting, and, uh, and and so difficult to talk about. Nobody came out and said, "You're here because there is a 23-year-old woman." dead upstairs because she killed herself. And so those things kind of came out as I was there for the next five or six hours with the mother and the father uh, learning the story, which was this, is that um, she was home and uh, had waited for mom and dad and her brother to go to the airport to send him off on a flight to Japan. He was in the Marine Corps and had taken her father's rifle and again, and had, it took her time to orient it, so 
the, the, the barrel was headed into her, into her head and had figured out how to, to set this up and had activated the trigger and uh, shot herself in the shoulder. It was unsuccessful and realigned everything and the second time she was successful in killing herself. And uh, I spent the day with her and uh, with, with her family and the, 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 the police came and the coroner came and it was this, this, this long process as I sit with, sat with the family and then watched sat with her, with her mother as she watched her daughter come down the stairs in a body bag. And it's, that's, it's an, it's a, it's a painful story. Um, I was grateful that that was at the beginning of my pastorate and was able to spend a lot of time with the family. I think the thing that I remember the most was just how incredibly disorienting, how incredibly disorienting, uh, suicide is. Um, and, um, that's, that's, that's my story. Um, so I've had um, I've had an, the experience of um, treating a patient whose husband had committed suicide, um, and um, I'll talk a little bit about that, and I'll talk a little bit about um, one of my patients who have passed away from suicide as well. Um, what struck me about treating this woman who um, whose husband had passed away, um, and it was relatively recently. I was actually one of my um, fellow residents patients. He was one of my fellow residents' patients um, who had committed suicide, and um, she started seeing me shortly after that suicide. Um, what really struck me was just um, how conflicted she was. Um, she, um, toward the end of his life, their marriage was very turbulent. Um, as you can imagine, if somebody has that degree of depression, in that degree of struggle, so um, she had very, very, um, she was very enraged with him. Um, and so part of her was relieved, um, but part of her was also enraged that he's abandoned her um, with their child. Um, and then part of her, although she was not very willing to admit the side, also was very sad um, and also missed him in a lot of ways. Um, so I was really, um, I was overwhelmed. I was a third year resident um, and um, I was really overwhelmed <coughs> by just how many intense emotions this woman um, was dealing with. And then also trying to raise their, um, I think an eight year old son um, and trying to explain to him what, um, how to perceive of this event that happened. Um, so, you know, a lot of the work I did with her was just simply sitting in the room long enough for the duration of the 45 minutes that she was able to express whatever she was expressing um, without running away, <laughs> uh, which I very much wanted to do a lot of the time. Um, so I think you know, that gave me an appreciation of just how turbulent um, suicide is um, how turbulent it must be for the individual when they come to that moment of suicide and how turbulent it makes the rest of the people around them. Um, my personal experience was with a patient um, that I had seen um, for about a couple of years in therapy. Um, and she um, was going through um, a lot of marital conflict um, and divorce around the time of her suicide. Um, and actually around shortly before the suicide, I had transferred her care um, to another provider because I felt that um, our, the work that we were doing together wasn't benefiting her and maybe it was actually even destabilizing her. Um, and she did have a short admission and um, it was actually right up and she seemed better um, toward the end of that admission, um, was discharged, seemed to be hap, um, stabilized, but actually did end up um, committing suicide a few days later. It was a real shock to um, all of the providers involved with her care, and um, it was particularly a shock for me because I, you know, um, I um, 
actually was very much hoping to resume work with her at some point. And I remember that the feeling was one of, oh my gosh, I'm never going to have a chance again that this person is just gone. Um, and that, you know, the finality of that was um, what was the really powerful in the moment. Um, I struggled for a long time with uh, feeling very helpless. You know, I, um, I, my head was swarming with all the things I should, should have done, could still do, maybe can still do, maybe I can, you know, uh, lots of different maybes, um, and a feeling of utter helplessness that really nothing can be done anymore because it's over. And that finality of that was just, um, I've never experienced any. Um, there was a lot of isolation um, I experienced as well that um, I felt at times very paranoid that I had done something wrong um, in my treatment of her um, and that um, I was going to be found out somehow, that somebody, um, her family members would be enraged with me, would sue me, um, that my colleagues would blame me for what I did, um, and I felt very ina inadequate. Um, I went through her chart and picked out every little single thing, and I documented every little single thing I could have done differently. Um, shows you a little bit of my own character pathology. But um, so the helplessness, the isolation, um, and I found myself, my own, in a, in a kind of in a spiritual um, confusion about how to think about him. Um, you know, I, I do identify as a Christian, and I was confused by this idea of, do I think about him as com having committed a sin? And where is he now? Um, and I found myself really unwilling to think about him being in such a terrible place um, and being stuck there. And un I also really very much wanted to forgive him for what he did. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I decided I did want to forgive him um, and that, you know, wherever he is, I did not want to believe that that was, that was hell. So um, that was another experience I had. Um, I found <coughs> my colleagues were incredibly supportive. Um, Dr. Lomax was incredibly supportive. Um, and it was very helpful to reach out to people. Um, um, personally, with um, my own experiences, there was once a young man who I had counseled in the Muslim community, um, and as I was telling uh, the co-panelists earlier, our concepts of congregation in the Muslim community are much more fluid, so we look at ourselves much more as a community than a particular congregation. So you can have anywhere from you know someone up in Champions or the Woodlands call me down in Sugarland and want advice at 2, 2 a.m. about a problem that they have. Uh, so this young man had had real conflicts with his personal identity, being that his fam his family was uh, his mother and father had immigrated to the United States, and he had uh, you know he had real confusion about who he was as a person, who he was as a Muslim. Uh, who he was as a Houstonian, and it, all of the all of these lives, you know, life problems that he had were just kind of culminating, and he had this urge that he said, "I just want to end it all. I don't want to deal with these problems anymore because any little thing that I do, my parents seem to equate any uh, contravention of what they believe to be quote unquote Islamic, which most of the time my personal experience is." what your mom and dad don't want you to do, right? Not necessarily a contravention of scripture. Um, you know, I get parents all the time, tell my kids to be good Muslims. What does that mean? Tell them to listen to me. Um, so, you know, his, he was very confused and he had this idea of faith that was, faith was something which was static. And if it was, I was not 100%, then I was nothing. And that made him despair in life and, 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 and despair in God, you know, in, in hope of God and, and despair in, in the faith that he felt dear, but he didn't feel that, feel that there was a, 
He didn't feel that there was salvation for him. He didn't feel that there was something to bring him out of the rut that he had gotten to because faith had been presented in a very mechanic, static form uh, in, his, in his personal experience. And so speaking to him about, uh, uh, you know, um, what faith means in the Muslim community and, and, and to Muslim theologians, uh, that faith goes up and goes down, uh, that not all of us have a static you know, high faith. None of us, we can, we can never really judge each other as to our level of faith and that our faith doesn't necessarily correlate with our appearance or with our actions. Certainly our actions help inculcate faith within us, but our salvation is by the grace of God uh, and through his mercy. Uh, and, and so by telling him that, you know, if you sin, right, or, you know, if, 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 you, if, if you sin according to God or you sin according to your parents, that doesn't mean that you are not a Muslim, not a member of a faith community, not a good person, because even the best of people make mistakes. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm pleased that, that, that he did not go through with what he had been contemplating um, and, quite frankly, became a very productive member of the community. There was a very difficult patch after this with his parents because when you as an elder equate your culture or family traditions with faith tradition, um, when your children decide to make different choices about their faith tra tradition, it can be very, very uh, difficult. Um, the other, not in a counseling sense, but in a personal sense, um, I have never spoken about this publicly. Uh, my father committed suicide. Uh, this is the very first time that I've said this to anybody. Um, he had uh, very severe late-stage dementia. And uh, he was one of those people who uh, said that if it ever got to that point, that he would not let his life continue. And I remember hearing him say that. But uh, it was much more severe than anybody in the family had ever realized. Uh, and we were constrained... Uh, from helping him because of social stigma, the stigma of talking about illness uh, and being frank about illness in our family. Financial, uh, you know, as my father as a retiree, although he did have a pension, it was very difficult for him to pay the, the, the medical bills that he would have needed to be able to have the care that would have been able to keep him away from that edge. So for me, it's very, very personal. It's uh, seven years now. And uh, I, I just felt that I needed to say it because I don't think that we realize the, the personal toll that it has on ourselves. I know that immediately afterwards, I, I, I personally fell into a very deep depression. And I, uh, I, I closed myself off from everyone for three months. <laughs> and, and this was... While I was, uh, you know, while I was preparing my master's degree thesis, so you can see my advisor was very pleased about that, right? Why aren't you answering my calls? Uh, okay, I can't really tell you right now, <laughs> but I have a good reason. Um, and, you know, I, I, I mentioned this because I think that one of the, uh, one of the things that we don't talk about enough is the, in, the warning signs of suicidal, um, of people who are suicidal. And in faith communities particularly, we tend to brush those under the rug. We don't want to deal with the fact that a person may have faith and may be struggling because we, like those parents that I described before, want to equate faith with perfection. And I think that that's a very dangerous concept to have. So before anyone completes suicide, we are not helping them, nor are we helping their families deal through that. And even afterwards, we're not dealing with suicide in a way that counsels the families. I, I know that particularly in the Muslim community, this, this uh, conflict about whether suicide is a sin or not, and whether you're going to hell for committing suicide. I mean, I know personally, I know imams and and, you know, um, community uh, resident scholars and things like this, that, you know, the first 
time you talk to them, they'll say, you know, I need to talk to you about suicide. Oh, that, that's a sin. Haram, you know, completely forbidden. Don't do it. I mean, I tell people, duh, I, right. I mean, as somebody who's struggling or as a family member who's asking, I think we all understand that. The question is, how do you deal with that? And then, of course, you have the, the, the conflict of where is this person in the next life according to your particular faith tradition? And, you know, as I, I regularly uh, give sermons, I, I give a sermon on suicide at least once a year uh, to educate the community uh, that there is much more nuance to dealing with this subject uh, that w than we give it credit. And that many times in faith communities, we tend to deny empirical evidence you know, and, 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 and then rely, rely wholly on faith. When in reality, our faith should be bolstered by science and by empirical evidence, not prevented because of it. Uh, and, and, and when we have these very false senses of what it means to have a faith identity, that makes us an impediment to that person's care, uh, not, an, not, not one that can assist. So I'm pleased to be here tonight, uh, and, and this is obviously probably the most therapeutic five minutes of my life. Um, but uh, I, I am very pleased to see both faith leaders uh, and medical professionals coming together um, to be able to help the community move through these issues. Thank you. Okay, well, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out um, today, and uh, I'd, I'd like to start by uh, commending my fellow panelists here for their candor and indeed their courage. Um, and uh, speaking of some some pretty difficult experiences, and, uh, and indeed I realize that uh, the story I'm about to tell that this is actually the first time I've told this story in public as well. And uh, so it's really great to have this door open. And I think that we, we all have a bit of an eagerness to, um, to tell these stories. Um, my uh, relationship with the topic of suicide uh, consists of two streams. One is academic, the other is clinical. I'm a, a therapist and I've treated many patients who have uh, struggled with the issue of um, living with pain or whether to end it all. Um, uh, early on in my career, very early, um, two forces sort of intersected, one being a need for a research focus to take a young assistant professor to tenure someday, hopefully, uh, combined with total fear and terror, uh, working with patients and feeling like I didn't know what I was doing especially in the context of a life or death um, uh, situation uh, with a patient. So uh, I guess I have a tendency to write about things that terrify me, and uh, so I, I chose suicide as a, an area um, to investigate and with a, an eye toward helping to develop um, interventions that were more effective uh, at, at helping people to, uh, to survive. Uh, it was early in, in my career, probably three, four years in, that I began working with a, um, uh, a young woman uh, who uh, had major depression. Uh, she had an interesting history. Uh, she was an ex-nun who uh, had entered the convent seeking um, meaning and purpose and belongingness. Uh, this experience had, had not worked out for her, so she left the convent and went to nursing school and uh, was in fact a, a practicing nurse at the time that she entered treatment uh, with me. Uh, she was one of these uh, perfect patients who showed up on time, if not early, for every appointment. Uh, she had given a lot of thought to things we had talked about, and indeed her mood steadily uh, improved as her depression lifted. Um, uh, in fact, she, one of the things she struggled with was uh, not having uh, a partner in life. She was uh, 
lonely and uh, hoping to find a, a mate at some point. But uh, she decided that it was time to, to, to treat herself to a vacation. We talked about this. She actually bought new suitcases and uh, took off to the Caribbean um, for a vacation. Um, during which I received a phone call that she had been discovered dead in her hotel room. Uh, this was such a shock to me uh, at the time uh, that I uh, concluded that this was clearly not a suicide. This was impossible. This was an unfathomable. And actually found myself calling the police detective who investigated the death and insisting that he do an investigation because this was clearly a homicide, not a suicide. Denial is a many splendored thing. Um, uh, indeed, the investigation showed that uh, her drinking glass in the room had traces of her antidepressant. And so being a nurse, she knew about lethal dosages and how to mix um, you know, the, the substance to, to use to kill herself. So. Um, one of my most vivid memories, uh, I thought that it was really important that this had happened. Um, and it, it was still sort of an abstraction to me, as shocked as I was feeling that it happened far away. And uh, I thought that it was important to, um, to move into this experience. And, and so I decided to attend the funeral service. Um, and this was uh, a very helpful thing uh, to me, though emotional, to uh, experience um, this service uh, for her family, her loved ones, and friends. And uh, I, I recall the experience becoming most real to me afterwards when I went up to uh, shake the hand of, of her father. And uh, I recall at, at that moment um, being so emotional that I could spirit, scarcely speak. Um, so uh, th this is, uh, as you might expect, uh, quite a learning experience. Um, uh, and in particular afterwards, uh, not knowing quite what to do uh, with all of these feelings um, and being very aware that there's no guidebook or checklist or um, anything of the kind to, to help a clinician through this. And um, Dr. Dew mentioned some of the feelings that go through a person's mind. What did I miss? How could I have missed this? What did I do wrong? What are people going to think? And there's a whole laundry list of uh, thoughts and feelings that, that occur. Um, and uh, I, I recall mainly just muddling my way through this, but this dovetails with my other story that I'd like to share, which is that as I moved into suicide as an area of research um, uh, expertise, the trainees in our program, um, so I was in West Virginia at the time, um, psychiatry residents in particular began uh, coming to me, Dr. Ellis, can, do you have a minute? can we talk? And um, these are young professionals in training coming by and saying, I lost a patient to suicide. And of course, my first question was, uh, have you talked with your supervisor about this? And um, consistently, the response was yes. And what I was told was, these things happen. And surgeons lose patients. And sometimes, we lose patients too. And the message being, it's time to move on. Um, this turned into another research focus for me. We did some studies showing that this, in fact, uh, was uh, a common experience among trainees in the mental health profession who, uh, number one, didn't get sufficient training in treating suicidal patients, and number two, had no guidance as to procedures to follow uh, in the aftermath of the death of a, su a patient to, to suicide. 
Um, so the, the, this is really uh, a situation. Uh, I think it may have gotten slightly better. We've published some articles about this and some guidelines about how to manage this situation. But we've got a long, long way to go. And um, uh, you know, uh, 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 we're all caught up in our culture, whether it's our faith uh, culture or our, our uh, health services culture or our culture at large uh, that tells us that this is a, um, a, a taboo subject and, and there's a lot of shame attached. If you listen to our, our language, for example, we he hear the word commit connected to suicide routinely and uh, this is part of our language until you step back and ask, well, why do we use that particular word? Um, you know, I. Uh, most things we, we don't commit unless they're, they're bad. Um, and, and so uh, we're, uh, we've got a, a long way to go. Um, we have a lot of work to do in terms of helping this to come out of the shadows. Um, and, and even as we speak, uh, uh, the, you, you see this happening and you hear, hear this happening, we feel it happening, that this is something that uh, doesn't belong in the closet and uh, uh, for heaven's sake, certainly a family member should not be saddled with this sense that uh, their family member did something uh, wrong or something unforgivable. And certainly within the profession, the mental health profession, that we really need to communicate to our practitioners and our trainees in particular that this is a clinical problem. It's associated with known uh, psychiatric disorders and it's highly treatable, and to the extent that we don't talk about it, we lose an opportunity to improve our success. So I'll stop now, and thank you for your attention. I'm amazed just listening to these people. You know, in the helping profession, so many people want us to fix their problems, or we have all the right answers, and yet listening, we don't have the right answers, and we're even in denial. And then we have uh, guilt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so how do we encourage our people to be open and, um, and dialogue of this, and yet at the same time, we struggle with openness and willingness and dialogue. And what can we offer to give them hope when we struggle ourselves? Two different examples. Uh, my own uncle committed suicide after many, many years of suffering from cancer. Uh, and yet he came from a family that I guess would be best described as in denial of a lot of things, not talking about anything. Uh, his wife, my aunt, found him, um, the gunshot to the head, and stoic. Good Polish uh, characteristic, unfortunately. Uh, stoic. And then several years later, she had three different children, and um, her two daughters had unique challenges, and yet her son was, quote, the healthy one. And yet he committed suicide, too. Um, how do you deal with that? And how do you, as a minister, quote, not only interact with people personally, but what do you say when you preach? How do you offer hope, you know? Uh, interesting to hear Dr. Uh, Dew talk about, is this a sin or what? You know, the church doesn't teach that. It, it comes from our own experience wondering, is there a salvation for this person? And then the other extreme was an elderly man um, who lived a wonderful life, et cetera, et cetera. And then he discovered he had an illness, and it was only like within a week. And then everyone was shocked when he committed suicide. Now, that family was a little bit more willing to talk. Because I have had times when you're almost told not to even use, even refer to the death. So how do you preach when you can't even talk about anything? It's like the big white elephant in the room, and yet how do you address this in a healthy way? And then you talk about God's love and mercy. Um, but in this particular case, uh, 
with a man who was like 90 years old and out, you know, it was like everybody's scratching their head. What happened? Um, and the preacher, uh, it was a bishop who actually did it and I learned a lot from him. Now, I'm not a sports person, so I might mess this up, but it, he would use the baseball analogy. A pitcher might be pitching a no-hitter, and it's a no-hitter until the ninth inning. And at the ninth inning, the lat, two outs out, and he throws that latch pitch, pitch out, and the hitter hits a home run and wins the game. And he said, most people in the pitching world will not remember it was a no-hitter until the last pitch. They'll only remember that. And this preacher said, remember, God remembers the 99% of what we're doing. And again, we don't understand the language commit. Is this a wrong etc cetera, etc cetera. we'll just remember the suicide and that sometimes we have to remember everything in context of the good the person does uh, we're supposed to quote fix people make things better and yet we struggle as professionals in various different health care uh, positions how do we deal with it ourselves how do we invite people who don't want to talk about it? And then how do we offer hope when there's so much despair? Um, and so th those are my comments for now. So thank you all very much for sharing. Um, you know, I, I think I speak for all of us here in the room and that um, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of all collectively mourning, um, you know, these personal experiences. Um, I, I think, you know, most of us here have been touched by suicide in one way or another or um, certainly can empathize with those who have. And, um, you know, I just want to thank you guys for sharing and taking the time to come out and talk about this again. Um, and so, uh, you know, right now, uh, I know we talked a little bit earlier about, um, you know, taking questions and writing them down on index cards. And so if you guys have... You know, I had some thoughts that kind of came to you while, um, you know, our panelists were graciously sharing their stories. And, um, you know, uh, now would be a time to kind of stick them up in the air so we can collect them and uh, kind of get those addressed. Oh, yeah, sorry. It might be easier just to pass them down. Um, Meanwhile, I feel that um, a lot of the questions that we had prepared you all sort of brought up while you were talking um, but maybe just to elaborate on a couple of things, <clears throat> um, I am curious, uh, and I think other people might be curious as well, too, if we could just talk briefly about exactly how suicide is viewed within different faiths. We touched on it briefly, but maybe if you all want to weigh in on that a little bit. At least from the Catholic Church point of view, we talk about the ideal of promoting life, protecting life. Um, the ideal is that we do not kill, per se. Um, there's an innate reality that we do want to promote life. Now, this might be tongue-in-cheek, but you know, how many of us driving down the road will stop for a squirrel? an animal, and so there is an innate desire to promote life and avoid this. Um, now this is Lawrence speaking, it's not the church per se, but this is how I can understand it. You know, certain things do happen. We don't kill, but self-defense is understandable. And we don't understand what affects the mind and the church, from uh, my faith tradition, is really understanding that the mind is a very complicated reality. And our catechism says 
you know, grave psychological disturbances, anguish or grave fear or hardship, suffering or torture can mitigate this because the goal is we promote life. And so is it a sin when someone um, is so affected by so many factors that he or she doesn't quite understand what's going on and does this action? And how can a God, quote, condemn this? And the church says there has to be mercy and that God in his infinite wisdom will take care of this. Um, in our funeral rite, we actually, there are many, many different prayers, you know, prayers uh, for someone who suffered illness for a long time, someone who died a sudden death, like a car accident or whatever, and that we can't explain it. There are two options um, that specifically one who had died by suicide. Try not over hope and solace and comfort when people, when families are dealing with this. Okay? Um, so the church would never say, as perhaps in the past, it is a sin. And I would think that would be other faith traditions because we don't understand it either. You know, it was interesting to hear um, people not from a ministerial point of view saying, is this sin? Because it's a question in everyone's mind. And yet, you can try to comfort and challenge and offer hope, and yet somehow you need to dialogue with them and still unpack that because they still wonder what will happen. And no one wants anyone we love, um, everyone we, we love, and hopefully people we don't necessarily enjoy being around with at times, we want them to have eternal life. Okay? I, I, I haven't met anybody that rejoices that someone's going to be damned. I think they're kind of kooky when they think that. Um, everybody, would, just like we have an innate desire to promote life, I think everyone has innate desire for eternal life, however that's defined. Uh, I, I'm not qualified to answer the question. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really interested in hearing more than speaking at this point. So, <laughs> Thank you. so within the within the Islamic faith tradition, um, there is definitely the the exhortation to preserve life and that life is sacred. And it echoes the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, in that, you know, verses of the Quran, you know, hearken back to verses which are found in the, the Torah that whoever takes one life, then is it, it is as if they have killed all of mankind. And whoever saves one life, then it is as if they have saved all of mankind. As well as other verses uh, that are unique to the Quran that say, and do not harm oneself, or do not do not kill yourselves, for God is indeed merciful with you. And I think that these verses all invoke a sense of hope when people fall into despair. Now, I think that you know when speaking about these issues, um, it's important to understand the context of faith traditions and how they position these issues as well. So. Islam, Islamic thought is very much like Jewish thought in that it, is a, it has both a spiritual and a legalistic side to it. And so, um, you know, just as, say, rabbis have halakhic law that, you know, these tomes and tomes of, of, of commentaries where they talk about the legality and the va validity of actions, uh, that doesn't necessarily reflect what the moral position um, or the uh, the the you know the salvic salvific position of that faith is it merely reflects how that action is conceptualized in this life and the same is true for the Muslim faith I mean we have many different schools of uh, of, of of law and legal ethics and discussions about these things and in general uh, Muslim jurists and theologians will say obviously one taking one's own life is not allowed. 
Now, what does that mean in the next life is something completely different. And I think that our struggle as counselors and faith leaders and people that interact with, with faith communities is how do you contextualize a legalistic discussion uh, for the common person that walks into your, your care facility? Um, so, you know, there, there are discussions about, for example, uh, you know, none of us can, can be certain of our own salvation. So part and parcel of Islamic faith is certainty in God and uncertainty in yourself. So much that a person can be, you know, doing good deeds their whole life and they might be, you know, there might be a hand span between them and the door to paradise uh, and then something turns around and they enter the hellfire. Whereas a person might be acting their entire life like the people of hellfire and there's a hand span between them and hellfire and then something turns around and they enter paradise. Now, these are not to be condemnations but to say that each and every one of us uh, is uncertain of their own faith. It was one of my friends um, used to <laughs> used to say. Actually, I heard him. We were speaking at a Catholic youth conference together, um, and uh, somebody asked him about the idea of salvation in Islam and what it means, you know, for 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 people that are sinners or people of other faiths. And he said, "Look, we have an obligation in this." life that there are categories for things and so if you are of another faith tradition i should not be trying to enforce uh my faith tradition and the expectations of that on you and that's reasonable but in the next life he said i prefer to let god be god because i don't want you know on the day of judgment to be standing there and waiting for my judgment and then god he, you know it's somewhat i know that in our community it would be considered you know uh an odd thing to say, but you don't want God to turn and say, Bob, what do you think I should do with Joe? Um, you know, he said, let God be God. Don't make the decision for God in the next life. And we find that, that idea echoed in Islamic texts. For example, there was a man who, uh, who fought very valiantly in a battle, yet the, the prophet Muhammad said that this person is uh, from the people of the hellfire. Uh, because although he fought valiantly, he threw himself on his sword at the end of battle because he was displeased with God's decision that he would be injured in battle and not be victorious. So it was an idea of pride, not an idea of despair. Whereas there was another gentleman, an elderly man, who fell into depression at the end of his life and cut open his fingers and bled out. And his son saw him in a dream. And he said, I saw my father in a dream and he was in paradise. And as he was in paradise, I saw the angels around him and he had his hand behind his back. And I said, Father, what happened to you? And he said, God forgave me for my faith and my following of the prophet. And he entered me into paradise. And he healed me completely and took away my pain, except for my fingers. So this young man goes to the Prophet Muhammad and he says, he tells them his whole story, and the Prophet Muhammad immediately puts his hands up in prayer and he says, Oh God, even his fingers. Oh God, even his fingers. Oh God, even his fingers. So I always mention that story when I give sermons or talk to the Muslim community about these issues because it's extremely important to be able to contextualize the, the motivations that one have or the, the, the despair and the depression that a person might have and not be extremely legalistic in our our communities of you know that's wrong well yeah sure it's wrong but do you know what's going on beyond that idea of right and wrong do you know the struggles that person is going through and do you know that god might forgive them and he might condemn you because you're uncertain of your own salvation so don't be so certain about others salvation